All right, hello, hello, and welcome to a video that I just told you I wasn't going to do, but now I'm going to do it anyway because I really like talking about the law of demand. I want all these videos to go in sequence with the same formatting and look great and be modern with a much better mic than I used to have because this one is excellent by comparison. So today we're going to be talking about lesson three, the law of demand in unit three, area study one, microeconomics in the new study design where the law of demand is exactly the same, but I'm going to explain it again. It'll mean I have like three or four different videos that explain the law of demand but hopefully I'll use new examples, I'll be clearer than ever before, and it'll mean you'll never ever forget anything that I tell you right now, and you'll get full marks on every demand question forever. So in the key knowledge, we're gonna be looking at the law of demand, the theory of the law of demand, including the income effect and the substitution effect. We're gonna be looking at the demand curve, including movements along and shifts of the demand curve. And we're gonna be looking at non-price factors that affect demand, the position of the demand curve, including changes in disposable income, the prices of substitutes and complements, preferences and tastes, interest rates, population demographics, and consumer confidence. So, once again, our learning intention is always to understand how resources are allocated in Australia, specifically today, how consumers will allocate their resources and the things that impact that. So, success criteria that you can define the law of demand, that you can draw a fully labeled demand curve, and that you can distinguish between a movement and shift in demand. So, with the law of demand, it's quite simple. As price increases, quantity demanded decreases. So what that means is as selling price goes up, consumers want less of that good or service. So as things get more expensive, you want less of it. It's pretty logical. On the other hand, as prices get cheaper, you want more of things. So as price decreases, quantity demanded increases. Either of these definitions are the law of demand and you can use them and they're totally fine. You can use either one, it doesn't matter which one. So it makes sense. When things get cheaper, you want them more. When they get expensive, you don't. So it's pretty logical overall. So then how we go about drawing a demand curve or line. So to get a full marks for a demand diagram, you're going to need multiple things. So you're gonna need a title. The title is always gonna be market for whatever good or service is um, the market. You're gonna to need to have your y-axis labeled prices. Usually you also wanna include the unit of whatever prices it is, it's normally going to be dollars. Then you need to have your x-axis labeled quantity. Often as well, you also want the units, like it might be in thousands. Including that is great. It saves you a lot of time and effort. And finally, you want to have your demand curve, which is sloping downwards because as price goes down or price decreases, quantity demanded increases, you're going to have that. And it's going to be labeled with a little d at the end to say that it is the demand curve. And there's going to be a fully labeled demand curve. A lot of people have told me in the past that they remember that demand goes downwards like this because it starts with a D and so does down. If that works for you, you might as well use it. So when selling prices increase, um, quantity demanded decreases and we call this contraction of demand. So if we look at this, if we look at this fictional market, if we set two prices, if we have $2 and $4 and we increase that price, we'll see what happens here is that we'll go from what we call Q1 and then we'll end up going down to what we call Q2. And you can see that overall demand has decreased. So we've gone from this point on the line over to this point over here. And we call that a contraction of demand. Then if we had the opposite happen and the price went down from $4 to $2, that would increase the quantity overall and would move along that line to a point where more is being demanded because the price is cheaper. And we call that an expansion of demand. Using this terminology is incredibly important. So using the word expansion and contraction when the selling price changes is very specific. It's only when the selling price of that good or service changes is really important. So whenever the selling price increases, it's going to cause a contraction of demand. And whenever it decreases, it's going to cause an expansion of demand. Then we get into movements of demand, I mean, shifts of demand. So they were all movements. Now we're gonna be looking at shifts. Shifts occur whenever non-price factors, so anything other than a change in selling price, either increases or decreases the overall demand without the price changing. So this leads to a whole new demand line being created and that's referred to as a shift of demand. And shifts can be either favorable, which is to the right, which is what is drawn in the diagram here, or unfavorable, which is to the left, which I've just drawn in now. So the key thing being that when there's a shift of demand, so if we have an equilibrium price set, so we'll call that PE, you can see that when the demand curve shifts, it means that at the same price, now there is either more or less quantity 
demanded overall. And that's really important. So something other than price leading to more or less demand being created. So if we'd use an example here that we're gonna get you on the next slide of all the things that impact demand overall, one example could be an increase in disposable income. If people have more disposable income, it means that after they pay tax, they've got more income left over. It means that they're gonna be more able to demand things they couldn't before. So suddenly, although the price of products has stayed the same, they want more of them. Therefore, they're gonna move from this point at QE and the demand curve is gonna shift out to the right and then they're going to want more goods or services. On the other hand, if people had to pay more tax, it's gonna cause an unfavorable shift of demand where they're gonna be demanding less at the same price. So we're gonna look at a bunch of examples of different factors that shift demand. And we'll draw up a few little curves on the side here. So we just talked about disposable income. We talked about successful advertising. So successful advertising is really important because advertising can also be non-successful. And so if we draw these crudely, make sure you've always got your axes labeled and it's a title here, but a successful advertising should cause a shift out to the right and that is gonna be favorable uh, because suddenly if advertising is successful, the price of the product stays the same, but people want more of it. We talked about personal income tax before. I'm gonna to get to these two very last because these are the most complicated ones. Seasonal changes. Um, yesterday, it was a very warm day. It was like 30 degrees in spring, suddenly, I wanted ice cream and I went to like that Augustus gelateri nearby because it was hot. I wanted ice cream. Ice cream was still the same price, but suddenly I wanted more of it. Beforehand, I hadn't demanded any in ages, but suddenly because of that seasonal change starting to get towards warm weather, people want more of it. Same with like frozen drinks, etc. Those seasonal changes can lead to changes in demand. Same with when we get to winter, suddenly people want far more winter clothes at the same price, but far less summer clothes. And so it will cause a favorable demand shift for winter clothes, but an unfavorable shift for summer clothes. There could be trends. So things sometimes get really, really popular and suddenly there's extreme shifts in demand for them. Um, and so that can have massive effects. Could just be an influencer saying, like endorsing something on Instagram or TikTok, and suddenly there'll be intense favorable shifts in demand for those items, even though the price remains the same. Interest rates also impact things. So lately, interest rates are rising. So recently, interest rates are on the rise. And what's important about that is as interest rates rise, people are less likely to borrow money because it's more expensive to borrow money, but also people who have loans are gonna be paying more interest on those loans. So it's gonna decrease spending and therefore is gonna to lead to decreases in demand. So I'm gonna to get to these middle two, which are a little bit tricky overall. So I'm gonna get rid of a little bit here and draw a second axis, because it's really, really important for these ones to look at. So we're gonna have another set, I'm gonna go demand here, and these ones are actually gonna put in the market, because the market's gonna help us a lot. So market for, all right, so, First up, we've got a change in price of a substitute item. So substitute items are basically any product where you can not buy this one and buy this one and almost be just as happy. So often things like where there's multiple brands in the same kind of product or the same kind of market. So you look at soft drinks, so like Coke and Pepsi would be an easy example. So if we had the market for Coke and the market for Pepsi, and so let's just say the price of Coke changed. So let's say the price of Coke went up. So Coke was $2 a bottle and went up to $5 a bottle. That's gonna cause a contraction in demand for Coke. However, Pepsi being the substitute item is going to have a favorable shift in demand because suddenly at whatever price Pepsi was originally at, people are gonna demand more of it because it's seen as a substitute. Then um, the opposite's also true. If Coke was to get cheaper, it would cause the opposite. So if we have the opposite here and Coke went from $5 to $2 on sale, suddenly it's less likely that people are gonna buy Pepsi because by comparison, it's more expensive and people are not gonna buy it because the substitute item got cheaper. So that's how substitutes work in this instance. And then we're gonna talk about complementary items. So we'll get rid of these and then we'll get into our complements. So if we have market for, again, so complementary items are all about things that go well together. And there are a lot of different examples of these. We'll go with some simple ones. Um, but um, yeah, essentially anything that goes really, really well together. So if we have market for 
milk, and then mark it for cereal. Because sometimes my toddler eats cereal without milk, and that makes me think she might be a psychopath. Because most people have cereal with milk. So in this case, more recently, milk has been getting more expensive. So milk has gone from about $2 a litre, and $2 for two litres, up to about $3 something for two litres. So it's going to cause a contraction in demand for milk. And that's going to cause an unfavorable shift in demand for cereal because those items go together. And because people are buying less milk, they're going to buy less cereal because if milk's more expensive, they don't want the things that go with milk. Other examples of complementary items are things like bread and butter, a pool and water, coffee machine and coffee, things that go together. When the price of one changes, it's going to greatly impact the price of the other. And so that's it for the law of demand and many, many factors about demand. We'll be looking at the law of supply next time. And then after that, we'll be looking at equilibriums as well. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to leave a comment below or email me, show at the running economy dot com. Hope you're having a wonderful day and enjoying what is probably your commencement program for economics. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.